Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. We have a very interesting guest today. Special Who, wasn't the adjective. No, it wasn't special. Interesting. interesting. We're going to stick like with that. interesting. This, this guest is someone with whom I've had very personal relationship. Um, he damn near killed me on more than one occasion. Um, this is my son. We are talking to my son. David, a.k.a. Dave Bontempo Jr. Um, so we're going to talk about David's, he, 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 quite frankly, I have to give him a little bit of credit here because he volunteered to, well, not volunteered, I kind of drafted him, but he said, yes. I didn't volunteer. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure Mama somebody said. else canceled because you asked me yesterday and told me I had to do this today. Well, hey, that's no, a lot that's of notes. actually... That's actually not true. We wanted to have you on because we're trying to batch some episodes. But so I asked my son to be on it and he agreed knowing that there was a good chance he was going to get skewered in this at some point or another. So welcome son. Um, and I'm going to let Kristen take the lead on most of this. So you don't feel a lot of pressure from your mom. Why so stop buckle, now? Oh. Why <laughs> stop now? <laughs> Buckle up because I get to lead the ride here. Anyway, David, thanks so much for, for being with us. And, and um, it's, it's going to be a fun time to get to sit and watch the family dynamic because Mary Fran won't let us meet live in person. <laughs> we yeah. have to meet on Zoom like the rest of the world. <laughs> yep. Certain people have to be kept at a distance. I think she lives in my backyard and watches my kids, but... <laughs> I have tunnels going to all their houses. They all live close enough. I dug tunnels. Hey, grandparents <laughs> do what they have to do. Okay, so let's dive into, into we're, you know, we talk about a, a person's journey and when they had to reset from a sucker punch and then rise and then revealing their brilliance to the world. But I, because since I get to run the, the train today, we're going to reverse it because I like to go backwards. And plus, it drives Mary Fran crazy, so that's even more fun. <laughs> so I would I like to... I would like to, I figured you'd be on with that. So let's let everybody know your brilliance. What is it that you do um, right now in your life? Besides being stuck at home with your kids, what is it that you actually do? Uh, I think personally is more important. So personally, I'm a father to three and a husband and uh, a person in rather long-term recovery, I guess, by definition, I will be have, I'll have nine years, August 21st. I got sober in 2011. And then professionally, I'm a chief marketing officer for a drug and alcohol treatment center called Dream Life Recovery, which is in uh, like central to Western Pennsylvania. Okay. So, so you let the cat out of the bag. You're just like Mary Fran. <laughs> <laughs> making me take a left turn, keep me on my toes. So you work in the recovery field, helping all of these folks do, do their own individual resets on their journey, because that's where you were years ago. And I actually didn't realize it was 2011, because that's when I started my um, nonprofit that I, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe we can have a, a conversation at some point about did you know when you got into, so you, you got sober then, how long did it take then that you get in, that you got into the field to do the work you do? Uh, my first year in 2011, I wanted to be in the field and was told I wasn't, you know, ready. Um, a lot of people want to become counselors or in the field, like their first month in recovery, because I think it's the first time they've had something to hold on to and felt value. It's very common that like everyone gets out of treatment. It's like, I want to be in the field. Um, so for the first year, I actually painted for a couple guys in AA and ran an alumni association at my treatment center that is basically just like a high school alumni association for people that get out and want to stay connected. Uh, they go back and do meetings and stuff. And the guy who owned the place told me, you know, do this for a year. And if you prove to me that you're serious, we'll give you a job. And, and at like 10 months, he ended up hiring me full time. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. So that's different from my journey of starting a nonprofit. <laughs> well, I you know, with 10,000 feet, not knowing what I was doing. The thing that's interesting to me and that, that I think is really important to note is that, you know, these, these people who are in recovery, their, their, their lives are a mess. I mean, they're just a complete and utter mess. But they have to understand at some point, and like I think David said, said it accurately, like they want to grab onto something right away, but they also have to learn 
I think that it's a process and that you have to have a little measure of patience because you don't get from, you know, A to Z right, right away. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. And, and we should have started this before we got on to say, if I ask you a wild question, just go, I'm not, let's move on to something else. <laughs> But I'm wondering um, if you can talk to, because we talked to, um, oh my gosh, Mary Fran, re refresh my memory of uh, Diana. Diana Dubs, yeah, Dubs. Mm -hmm. from Dream Life, yep. And she, um, now I'm sure everybody has a uh, different story, but her thing was that her family dropped her off at the recovery center and said, this is like your last chance. Like it was, they were going to not um, support her anymore if she didn't figure it out. So it was kind of like an external and then she had to come up with something internally to stick with it. Now, do you feel like yours was more external or did you have something internal that said, okay, I'm done with this? The first 30 times were external and the last time was internal. Oh, and that's okay. about as honest as I can be. I mean, there were external circumstances at the time that worked, but people say to me all the time, like, how many times did you try and get sober? And like the real answer is one. Like how many times did I go to treatment, inpatient, the answer is two, outpatient, several, counseling, doctors, but like actually want to be sober is one. One time. So I the think, one time you wanted and it worked. Wow. Well, so it worked only, be, it, it wasn't, I mean, would you say, David, that you that you learned anything necessarily new that time that it worked or that you accepted what they were finally telling you as, Hey, I got to do something different this time. I don't, and I don't think there's anything, there wasn't new lessons, but being in a different place to absorb them is way different. And so like, that's what I say to people when they're like, you know, I don't want to go back to rehab. I know what they're going to say. And it's like, yeah, they're not going to say anything new. You're not going to, I mean, maybe you'll hear a counselor who is into like holistic modalities as opposed to 12 step. Like that's possible, mm -hmm. but the foundation for getting sober doesn't change. You want to more or want to less. And that's why like people, I say, a lot of people say to me, like after their first time, like, I don't, I know what they're going to say. I don't need that. And sometimes it's like, yeah, you just need space to be in a confined environment and maybe be more susceptible to the lessons you weren't last time. So I don't think I learned anything new in like, if you look at the curriculum of both days, but I think the mental capacity, the option that like I could actually do it, I believed, and that I actually wanted to was way different. Okay. The first time I was scared, but I wasn't ready to be done. Huh. So, you know, it's funny. And, and Mary Fran just loves when I talk frou-frou stuff or anyone talk frou-frou stuff. She despises it. However, yeah, I don't know what that is. It's like the <laughs> universe doing. No, no, no I do. I, I understand. I'm just. Yeah. So, but they, so many people in that realm will say you're, the universe is constantly giving you the same information. You're going through stuff that over and over until you learn what you need to learn. And you're, um, you're saying that as well, that it's the same stuff. It's just a matter of when your mindset shifts to look for a different meaning in it, I guess. And that, I guess, is what, what you're saying happened on your journey. Yeah. They say everything you learn in rehab, you already learned in kindergarten. <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny. Um, I mean, it wasn't funny at the time. It's funny now, but we, we would have conversations when he was in rehab and he would say things to me like, Oh mom, you know, I had this session with this counselor today and he told me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be, the things coming out of my mouth were, Oh my gosh, honey, that's great. The things going on in my head was you little son of a gun. I've been telling you that stuff your entire life. But it was only when he was ready to hear it and another voice. I mean, what, what tipped the scale for you, David? What was it that made you think I got? Because the second time you had to go back to rehab, you were nowhere near as bad as you were clearly the first time, which was precipitated by an overdose. But the second time that you went back, was there something in particular that flipped that switch for you that made you go like that's it I, I can't do this anymore no nah, everyone asked that and I mean even like I mean taking initiative to make phone calls and stuff and not letting dad do it was one thing but like even when I got there I was like I'm just gonna like dry out for a couple of days and leave 
Um, I, I didn't have a desire to be sober the rest of my, everyone asked that, like what clicked, like time took more time and then more time. Um, there's no, there's a million little aha moments, but there's nothing that was like, okay, like I'm really ready. And I think like, I don't know. I just, I had nothing else to believe in, consider, try. And I mean, I felt like I wanted to be done, but I didn't really feel I could be. Hmm. So this is one of the greatest things. This is one of the, my most favorite moments on this show, because I'll tell you why. So many people will say like, I had this awakening. I had this <laughs> moment. And a lot of us do. I got railed on the head by my three-year-old to, to shift my whole thing. But when I feel like people get discouraged and they don't feel like they're on the right path or it's never going to happen for them because they haven't woken up and had the aha moment. And you're just saying what, what we were just saying with our, our interview with David Fagenbaum. He said the same thing. It was like one day at a time. Okay, let me do this for one day. You're like, I'll dry out for three days. And then because you look at it as the big journey, I'm never going to get there. I don't even care to get there, you know? I love it. I love that you just said that because that there's a heck of a lot of people that are going to be like, thank God, I don't have to wait for that. Aha. Uh -huh. No, nah, there, there never was one. And I mean, they like, even like people ask me to like speak at treatment centers now and it's like, I'm so unrelatable to the guy with a day clean that like we really encourage speakers to have like 60 days to six months because that's achievable a year, two years, five years, like, it's just not. And I mean, I don't mean I don't relate to them on a level that like, I understand. But when they're looking at someone with years and years, it's like, dude, I don't even know if I'm going to make it here. Yeah, yeah. And there's, yeah, there was no aha. Uh -huh. No, <laughs> not at all. So it was just, uh, there were certain things, though, that 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 second time when you came home there was a noticeable shift in something about you like you wanted to go to church five days we went to church five days a week for months monday through friday nine o'clock mass david and i and there were just like that you were you weren't fighting anymore you weren't fighting me like i would tell him you know he had to be whatever responsible doing this he had to get i made him give me receipts for every penny that he spent I made him, if he ever left the house, he had to take a picture of where he was and send it to me. Now, he could have faked any of this stuff, mm -hmm. but he didn't fight me on it, which he had fought me the whole time on everything. And, and what, what was that? Like, what happened? I mean, I think it's just a lot of little things. It was like, you know, like I go to sobriety group and meet Danny and I meet Joey and all these people and Dave and Anthony and you know a month turns into two and then you know I stay in touch with Peter and I see that like it could lead to a career painting for guys in AA like it, it was just allowing yourself to be absorbed by like this community that's like actually I mean now even even eight nine years later it's more mainstream but you know, back then it wasn't ultra like publicized, but it was pretty strong where like, I remember coming home and being like, wow, there's like 50 AA meetings within a mile of my house. Like I had no idea. I could tell you where the drug dealers and the bars were. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I just think there were so many little tiny hints that like it was, I was doing right this time and like that there was a chance for it to get better. Um, that you could actually have fun without, you know, getting loaded and like going to like a couple concerts my first year with a bunch of dudes in sobriety and, you know, snowboard trips. And I think it was just a lot of little, little nets to catch you before you fully fell. Hmm. Yeah. I yeah. like that. that. That's, you know, it's funny, but it's the Kristen, I hadn't really picked up on that before talking to David about this. And I am hearing that message over and over again, that we, it it doesn't have to come in the form of a big reveal and it doesn't have to come in the form of a big step because we talked, David and I talked about this early on and um, it was like, he, he said this, one of their, one of their mantras is just do the next right thing. 
Mm -hmm. And, and I had said, there's another young guy that, um, that I talked to that was um, in recovery and we spent some time together. And I used a lot of the things that I talked to David about, but I remember saying to this kid, if you just do one right thing every single day in six months to a year, you're not going to believe how your life looks. And I think you experienced that David. And so did this other kid. So there's something to be said for those small steps just move on incrementally and then you make exponential changes yeah i mean it was most i've forgotten you know most of it's funny like they just talked about eminem just had um 12 years sober and this kid that was my first roommate in treatment now i'll have nine years he's coming up on like three or four but we were talking about like how that record like was this foundation the first time we were away and like there's just so many things that you forget like oh my god i remember that meeting or i remember this or and it just yeah. builds up into a lot of memories that don't suck and i guess that's why <laughs> that's quite we a had a lot that did that's yeah. quite a quote a lot of memories that don't suck i like that absolutely <laughs> i remember saying to to david like early on in recovery and all that kind of stuff where you know, we would butt heads a little bit about um, the boundaries and things that we would put on him. And I remember saying to him, look, you know, until we make new memories to replace the old ones, you have a lot of that instinctive, almost cellular memory reaction where something happens and you go, oh my God, something like this happened before and it's bad, but you have to allow yourself the grace to work through that. And that's not always easy for people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things that I learned was like, you can have two polar opposite emotions at the same time. Like you can be excited that you're clean, but like scared to stay clean or like you can be happy that you're clean, but sad that your friend relapsed. And like, that was a big thing where like your whole body doesn't have to live in like one paradox of an emotion. And I remember like, that was a big, like, that was a big lesson, you know? And it's one of, it's kindergarten. I mean, you get, a sheet with all the happy faces and smiley face and you pick which emotion do you feel right now? It's that simple. But I remember like realizing you could feel several at one time and it's funny. It's like, like Steve jobs always says every rule that you follow, never forget that it was just created by another human being that was no smarter than you. And so it's like, I'm happy. I'm sad. I'm this, I'm that, you know, everything that you've been like accustomed to feeling is usually based on repetition of other people. And I always just thought like, well, I'm happy now. Well, I'm sad now. And that's like, you can be a lot of things at once. So, you know, it's funny that you say that I, for so long was in this mode of, oh, okay, I'm having a happy day, happy day. And something horrible or whatever would bring me back down. I'm like, damn it. I have a sucky day again. And yep. I, I didn't think that you could bounce up and down, right? And yeah. then I read this book by Scott McIntyre, who was the first, he was on American Idol in like one of the very first seasons. He was oh, yeah. the blind guy on American Idol. And his famous thing was when Ryan Seacrest went to high five him and the whole world was like, you can't see the high five, you know? <laughs> and he wrote this book that, oh, it's gonna drive me crazy what the title is. I'll think of it. But his book was about, here he is on American Idol and nobody knew that there was all kinds of stuff behind the scenes that the producers were doing to sort of trip them up kind of thing. Like they wanted specific people to win. Plus his kidney was failing while he's there. So his whole book, you're exhausted by the end of this book, but the whole book is while he was having the biggest high moment of his life, he always had the bottom coming out, but that's just the way he, he by the end, you're convinced that life is just up and down and that's okay. And I was always like devastated, then up high, then devastated. Yeah. And I'm like, you can have days and weeks where you're just on the wave. Yeah, I think, I mean, and that's like such a big thing is like every kid going to treatment now, everyone's dual diagnosis, self-diagnosed, everyone's well, I have depression and anxiety. And like, I mean, I suffer from anxiety like anybody, but I remember like be you're in a state of depression. Like you can have depressing moments and not be in that manic state of depression. It was just like, I don't know. I just think I, I rewrote a lot of like the rule book for myself, like the first mm. year. I like that. Yeah, I think, I think, um, 
you are always a super intense person and you are always a super sensitive person. And I think, unfortunately, for people who come at life from that perspective, you, you tend to be ruled by what you feel, even though you're really smart, you tended to be ruled by what you felt and didn't realize that those things come and go and they, and they aren't necessarily the, the reasons to act. Yeah. And you acted a lot based on what you felt as opposed to like, all right, let me just get through this. And then, you know, 20 minutes from now, I might feel differently. Yep. That's very true. So this is incredible insight into this whole journey. I want to switch gears a little bit now though, to what we talk about all the time. We've actually gotten some, some nice smarty pants words for it now, but we say a skill is a skill is a skill. We've heard, you know, transferable skill, repurposing skills. So the skills that you use now in, in what you do, so you're helping all of these people reset their lives, which is always so uncanny to me that you decided to make this choice of, okay, I'm good now. And instead of just going off on your life, okay, I'm good now. I, I got this. You're, you turn around and you help all these other people. Let's talk a little bit about the, have you had the skills like that to, to be, um, caring and empathetic and all of that are those things that you've you've had your whole life that you just tap back into now i think like caring sensitivity and that kind of stuff yeah um i think there's a lot of different facets that go into it like initially i wanted to be a counselor um i don't know how good i would be at that because I've, I've become very blunt and abrupt and counselors I admire that like you know they can go through like there's a long journey with someone and not feel a ton of progress or the progress regresses and I did something I think my dad had me do like a um a one of those like fake career test things where it was like what should you do with your life and like my, I don't know if it's my dad or school I forget but it was you should be a barber or a tattoo artist because like you those two things like a haircut's immediate and the gratification is like somebody likes oh. it so it's an immediate gratification yeah it wasn't like that and it was like if you do a tattoo on someone like right away you can see they're happy and so it was like this people please it was pretty deep actually it's like this people pleasing thing that like but it also said like i don't like to like put in work for anything like i need immediate gratification or i'm bored with it and uh -huh. so you know, I think from the, the business development side of what I do, which is like relationship building um, and, and calling it sales is not really correct, but I, I think like marketing and branding, my dad always said, you know, you have that gene where you can build rapport with people and relate to them. Um, so it's definitely a mix. And I think I've done a couple jobs in the behavioral health field, working inside the center with people. And like I said, I admire those people, but that, that wouldn't be the long term thing for me. I like being out and, you know, figuring out the needs of an organization. We do a lot of work with companies and their HR departments and that kind of stuff. So I like that kind of building these models for, you know, what's needed and creating relationships. I'm also hearing that. So we always talk about your tribe and your team that's around you. And I'm, I don't, I'm sure that you didn't always appreciate the tribe that you have that, cause I'm hearing, you know, and knowing Mary Fran, that's like, here's how it's going to go, you know, and, and the boom, 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 <laughs> here's how it's going to go, which you need. And then, but I also just heard for um, the first time about that. You're saying that your dad said you have these skills, like pointing out what you have. And uh, to tell you a real quick story about my Mitchell, who is my resident button presser in this house and in my nerve system. My that one's mine right there. That kid there, he's my yeah. button presser. <laughs> well, Mitchell's very good at pressing buttons and Mitchell is brilliant, which is part of the issue that he's always looking for something to get his mind going. But he went through a really hard time last year. And I was, I'll never forget, I was at the bus stop with him and I'm like, and he's in high school and I'm like, Mitch, you need to do this and this. And he was like, I start yelling at me. We have these beautiful conversations, mother and daughter. <laughs> and he's like, why do you keep telling me that I have these strengths? You don't know. Why are you telling me I have these strengths? I'm like, because you do. I see them. You've done this, you've done this. And then he was like, oh, and then the bus came and I was exhausted after that five minutes. <laughs> But that was a little, that was the little turnaround in his brain. Like it to one person believing and saying, you have this in you. I see it. But then you need the other, 
you need the band cop that says, keep going because here's all the rules. But so in that you had that, that tribe around you, I think that's what's so important no matter, you know, a lot of times we're talking about coming back from something huge or in your business or whatever, having your tribe and your tribe can be right in your own house. People don't necessarily look to their family members as being their tribe. So that's pretty cool. I think it's interesting too. Like I still go to therapy pretty regularly and like I always come home and tell my wife, like I have a new diagnosis and like, it's either like narcissism, um, <laughs> egomaniac with an inferiority complex. Um, but the biggest one recently is imposter syndrome. It's a real thing that when you get to a certain level professionally, but you're always afraid you're going to get fired or the world's going to fall apart and you don't believe the hype that everyone else believes and there's self-sabotage and there's this. My dad used to say all the time, my mom too, like you have all these gifts if you could just use them for good instead of evil. Um, <laughs> but I didn't believe any of that. And mm -hmm. I think even now, like I, I struggle with it. Like if there's a bad day at work, it's like a oh, company's going to close. I'm going to lose everything. Um, and my therapist literally makes me do these things called feelings worksheets where it's like what real facts support your anxiety right now. And it's like, it's crazy, but it's so true. And it's like, it's like a kindergarten activity and I do them all the time. Feelings work. You know, I like I think that. You have to, yeah. I think you, you have to recognize when you're creating a reality that's not true. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, literally you write down all these columns as to what, facts support your fear what facts contradict it what happens if the fear really does come to, like it's but it's just very true yeah. well that's a big that's a big part of that and we should look more into that if you can i don't know if you can send us anything on that because yeah that's, I mean, I can huge, send it to you. that's a huge them. part of that mindset part the very beginning in the reset because if mm -hmm. you can't get rid of that if you yeah. can't reset from that, then then the rising, you might go up a little bit, but you're gonna die. Maybe that's where people are getting stuck in the plateau, not getting where they want because they never actually did a full reset there. They're, they're still hanging on to some things. Yeah, that's yeah I mean, I think like the big thing they say in, in AA and NA, you get a coin or a key tag for 24 hours, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then it waits till six months. And um, like, there's this study that we're in such an immediate gratification society that a lot of people relapse between that four to six months because they feel they're waiting too long and they're not going to get any attention and everyone needs a trophy for everything. And, um, it's an interesting mindset. Like we have, we do a daily email that I have my team send every day, especially now, what did you do to be great today? And, um, the the one guy wrote something that said like I, I really don't feel I did anything to be great I was this I was that and, and referencing you guys he was resilient in the day but not nothing happened that was like fireworks and I said like you know true greatness isn't the moments it's what happens in between it that prepares you mm -hmm. for it and I think that's what if you study anything with my generation and below if there's not immediate gratification uh, there's a lot of either lost hobbies or you know, skateboards thrown in the closet and stuff. Cause if you're not a master right away, my dad always says there's too many options for you guys. I, I think it's true. I do hmm. too. And that's actually, yeah. it, it's shedding a lot of light on, on me for this generation and the whole that there is so much addiction and so much of that stuff. And I, I, mean, I say, in my opinion, a lot of it has to do with where you, young people are growing up under the weight of their parents' dreams that are never going to be realized because they're their parents' dreams. They're not their own dreams. And they're under the weight of that. But at the same time, we're also not letting them figure things out on their own, not letting them ever practice resilience um, for the most part. I mean, there's, there's families that aren't doing that, but there's a lot of families that are. And this whole thing about instant gratification, everybody getting a trophy, everybody being rewarded for everything when it's not even that big of a deal. Yep. It's such... You just that I don't know. You just see so many people that like. I remember like telling somebody like the, the second Christmas you're sober is like not that big a deal. It's expected, and hmm. when it's not that like I'm so proud of you anymore. I don't want to say it takes a special person, but there's a reaction there of like oh like there's no balloons right now. Like the third <laughs> family party, everybody's not like oh my god you're doing so good you look so great like. And like my sponsor always used to say to me, like, that's, that's where the growth becomes. Like they expect that of you now. They're not hoping for it. It's already there. Now it's your job to keep it 
you know, consistent. So did you feel like you had to fill in blank spaces somehow when you didn't get that kind of um, acknowledgement and, um, you know, because you're right, there, there comes a point at which you're, you know, the, the, the people who surround you in that period, they, they want to get to the point where they don't have to acknowledge it anymore. Because after a while, you're just exhausted by it, you know, so you want to get to the point where you don't have to make a fuss over the fact that somebody's not drunk or high. But from their perspective, it takes something away from them. And from our perspective, it restores something. It restores like a natural balance. So did you feel that like, were there any points where you thought like, God, I got to fill this somehow, this hole? And is that, I mean, you collect stuff. You like collect toys and stuff like that. Is that a part of this, do you think, for a lot of people that they have to fill in those spaces then? I mean, I've always been trying to fill voids with exterior stuff. That's not a sobriety thing. And I think, you know, they always say like outer solutions to inner problems, like what clothes you wear or like, you know, I've always had weird, you know, mohawks and all this and like reaching out for attention. Um, so I think I was always looking to, unbeknownst to me, fill a void. But um, in sobriety, it, I didn't feel it like the four to six month thing. I had enough guys with like a lot of years that like, when I got 90s, we're like, okay, get 91. Like it's, and like, that's a big thing now. Like a joke with me and my friends is like, cool. Like congrats on nine years, like nine years in a day is a lot cooler. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. the, the people that it's a big deal to, um, they need to find something else. Like it's a good eye grabber of, wow, that coin meant a lot to me. Um, it meant a lot to me eight or nine years ago. It's still the foundation, but I don't get like that rush because there's a lot of other memories now that I don't feel I need like a coin to justify it. So I think it was, it was part of the hook, carried them around a lot. Um, but I had a lot of guys that were like, you're, you're not that special. Like, <laughs> I love those guys. <laughs> I've been trying to get you to realize that your whole life. <laughs> I never have them in my tribe. I need them to tell me all the special people, all the time. <laughs> all the moms go, oh, you're so special. I was not saying that. I was not the one saying that. You're not that special. <laughs> I, was, I was the anti your special mom. <laughs> I wore yeah, a I mean, they, man. they would say we care more about saving your life than hurting your feelings. And that was something that was like pretty heavy. Yeah. 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 So now... Tell us about, so you're at Dream Life, what, um, and you've, you've had experience at a couple, with a couple of different places. What, what do you see in that organization that serves in a way that maybe other places didn't? What feels right to you about that? Um, I mean, I know we've met, we've met some of your team members and they're like, Diana is just, amazing. I mean, these people come at it, so many of them that I've had contact with, just come at it from this place of genuine, first of all, knowledge, because many of them have walked that walk. And second of all, a sense of empathy and concern for people. And I I don't know if that's the way it goes in a lot of places, because unfortunately, a lot of, you know, this is a business that, you know, that that world of of addiction and all that, it's a big moneymaker for people. And, um, I mean, the people that I've met through your place don't seem to have that. That there's a there's another reality for them, and it's really about people. I think I'm thinking of a diplomatic way to not <laughs> make it a sales pitch for where I work now, and then a non sales pitch for other places. I think the most appropriate answer is that, and most people that choose to make a career in behavioral health, regardless of where they work, specifically the therapist, admissions the tech staff, which is basically the people running all over, keeping everyone safe. Um, There's fantastic people at all the organizations that I've been at. And I think um, the people that make that choice, it's something special. Um, I think the field, like any field, when money's involved, it can turn certain people into, you know, piranhas and and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm very happy where I'm at, I think being physician owned and it being something that no one had to do for financial gain, but more of a vocation. Mm -hmm. Um, 
it makes it easier. It also makes it harder um, because there's, yes, it's a business. Yes, you need to, you know, admit people to keep the lights on. Addiction gets a bad rap. Uh, For-profit education and, and hospitals are very symmetrical to the way addiction treatment is run. Um, but there's not as much scrutiny with people, you know, trying to get admissions for colleges and stuff. Uh, but it sometimes makes it harder because if you don't have the desire to compete with the guys who may be cutting corners, your results may be pure, mm. but it's like the Lance Armstrong thing. Like everything that guy's done is completely spoiled because everyone knows now that it was induced by chemicals. And so the people trying to compete with that, you can't unless you're doing something wrong. And I think that's the lesson I've had to learn is I'm comfortable competing where I'm at now. And if a patient chooses to go to another treatment center that one of my friends work at, um, I'm okay with it if it's, you know, good people there. And there's guys like Joe and all those other people, Justin, um, that they, they run a lot of good centers. And I think, you know, it's more important. A lot of people, you know, this center versus that center, I'm more, I like to compete with the good guys. And if I lose out to one of them, I can deal with that. And I think that, there's a lot of people, especially in this area, that make this a vocation and they do it because they want to help. And I just try and stay in that circle. It's a good lane. So I have a question now for and 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 you can think about this one, but I wanted I want your thoughts on where we're at right now with the I keep calling it the corona crap. I have to stop calling it that because it's <laughs> unprofessional, but I don't care. It's getting it on my is. nerves in so many areas corona of crap. life. So what would your advice or what are your thoughts on so many people right now? Like, are you guys as an organization and as a field in recovery, are you experiencing or are you bracing yourselves for lots more issues with all these people that are losing their life's dreams, their businesses? Are you, are you preparing for, are you worried about that there's going to be a whole influx of, of issues? I don't think... I, uh, my thought process is, is a little different than most. I don't think like if you're a heroin addict before Corona, you're not going to be more of a heroin addict during it. What I think is going to lift up a lot is the people that are quarantined. Depression's going to go up. Suicide rates could go up. Marital problems. I think a lot of young people between 18 to 30 are going to be riddled with DUIs when this is done because their tolerance for alcohol is going to go way down. They're going to go out drinking with their friends. And I think the DUI rates are going to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. um, I think people that have a prescription that may be taking it normally. And then, you know, I didn't wait every four hours. I took it every two. And then I think the people that you wouldn't think are addicts are going to start getting either addicted or in trouble. I don't, I mean, we, we're still admitting patients that, you know, it, it's kind of like they say like um, a, a, a cucumber can turn into a pickle, but once you're a pickle, you can't turn back into a cucumber. Like people that are addicts have been addicts and are going to be, but I think that's the population that's in the most danger. So are you guys still taking patients actively with all of this? Like what kind of, how are your facilities operating? So I think the the what we've done is one follow any kind of federal guidelines if there was a quarantine from certain states and stuff like that abide by those rules um we in early march closed down all entrances but one have like hand washing stations for staff um masks all that kind of stuff um and we've been admitting patients on a case-by-case -case basis um, it's like, they call it a PSA. It's a pre-admit like screening where you answer all the questions. And then we've added, I think it was a federal regulation, um, of like a COVID screening. And then there were certain people where they could do drive through testing and, and stuff like that. The issue is that there's no, at least as of right now, um, FDA approved test that like is instant. That's like, okay. Here's, you know, a mouth swab. Five minutes later, you're cool. You can come in. So it's kind of case by case. It's a challenge for you guys. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I, you know, in some of the, the, the things that I've written about this, it, it, 
it's not taking a vacation because of coronavirus. I mean, you still have people who are really suffering who need help. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, it's, uh, I get calls 10 times a day about people trying to sell me tests and, you know, they're not FDA approved. And so, yeah, but they're in compliance with this and, you know, certain places want to utilize those tests because it's some kind of measure. Other people feel that the liability is if they use a test that's not necessarily FDA approved and God forbid something happens where they negligent so like i just yeah it's yeah. the most confused i've ever seen the the state of healthcare. what are you yeah. doing in terms of meetings for if you can't gather are you guys still figuring out ways to be supportive this of this. this oh this oh this okay this. All, oh zoom fine every every aa and na clubhouse is doing zoom meetings um outpatient therapy is all telehealth now hmm. um it's pretty much sitting in front of a computer like this. Uh, I'm doing it with my team and every work meeting that we have is this, but recovery wise, it's the same thing. Um, you know, we're encouraging people to stay with us, even if their insurance stops paying, we've scholarship several because I had a young kid who left treatment and came home um, to our side of the state and Jimmy goes to his clothes the job he works at is laid off. The yeah. IOP that he works at, which is intensive outpatient, is only doing Zoom meetings. And the AA clubhouse is closed. So he comes home and he's still, you know, 30 days clean. You still have your demons. And all he kind of has is the computer and, you know, hopefully the, the will to get by. So it's, it's yeah. crazy. It's a lot harder right now. So where can people, because one of the things, honestly, that makes me proudest of you is that you will help people regardless of what their specific circumstances are. So how can people find you um, and reach you and, you know, give us the company's website and all that so that they know where you're at? Um, I don't want to say, I think the first thing that's most important is, um, a-A-S-E-P-I-A dot org is a place where you can find AA meetings. Oh, okay. Um, that's probably the first most important one. And I'm looking at these up as I'm doing this, which probably isn't appropriate, but. Um, <laughs> we're, we're kind of known for being inappropriate. Yeah, we, <laughs> that fits right in. <laughs> and, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I should know this, but N-A for Narcotics Anonymous, N-A-Works dot org is the one for Narcotics Anonymous. The first one I gave you was A-A. Um, I mean, anybody can reach us at dreamliferecovery.com. Um, my number is 215-852-3299. It's been the same number since I was in sixth grade. <laughs> and uh, my email address, david.bontempo at dreamliferecovery.com. Uh, but definitely want to stress the first two websites are way more important than the last. Perfect. Awesome. Well, son, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Wasn't that painful? No, see, I told you it would be all right. That's why I let Kristen take the lead. Thank you, Fontempos, for letting me be in the fam for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> I say dorky Once things you like get that. in, you want out. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's a circle that once you break in, you're looking for the exits. Get me out of here. Like that in AA, too. I don't ever want to be a member of a club that would have me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, well thank I you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for then, coming on. Uh, go back to this, give those little babies hugs now since I can't do it. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, reach out to David if you are in need of help. Reach out to me if you're a family member and in need of help. We talk to people all the time. It's a cause that's clearly near and dear to our hearts. And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And we will see you next time on Brilliantly Resilient Live. Thank you. See ya.